All right, let's continue. Now, by the time of his assassination, Thomas Joseph Mboya was arguably the man who was to take over as president after Jomo Kenyatta. His political ambitions and zeal could be seen by his peers in the country and across the borders. How was he able to travel to the white man's land at a time where Africans were not even allowed to move freely in their own countries? And why was he the white man's choice? Well, Aguto Rosa with the political life and times of the late trade unionist. I leave you with that. This footage was taken right after Tom Boyer, Kenya's Minister of Economic Planning and Development, was shot. He was shot on 5th July 1969. The first bullet caused hemorrhage from the jagged wound in the aorta, while the second bullet hit his shoulder. Much as doctors tried to resuscitate him, the first bullet had already done the damage. At the age of 39, Thomas Joseph Mboya took his last breath. A few people were allowed to see him before he was taken to the morgue. It became so chaotic outside that the police had to be called to control the situation. Who was Thomas Mboya? Why was he assassinated? Were his assassins driven by his popularity in the country or his association with the West? This is the story of Thomas Joseph Odiambo Mboya. I am a Gutu Rosa. Well, this expression cannot just be defined in one word because uh, it represents a lot of things. It represents, for example, our belief that in Africa, the kind of economic, social and political institutions that make sense must find their meaning in the African setup. 5th July 1969 was just like any other busy day for Tom Boyer. That morning, the East African Standard had published his photo that was taken the previous day at Embakasi Airport when he had arrived from an EAC meeting in Addis Ababa. He was supposed to be in London to attend a conference at the University of Sussex on the crisis of planning that was to begin on 7th July on a Monday. However, he chose not to go directly and decided to come to Nairobi to attend to work. In his book, Tom Boyer, Professor Bethel Logot says, Mboya knew that there were plans to assassinate him, and some of his close friends had attempted to persuade him to travel directly to Britain from Addis Ababa. But Mboya had replied that if some people in Kenya were determined to kill him, a few days in Britain will merely be postponing the day of reckoning, unless he went into exile, which was not an option. After buying lotion at Chani Pharmacy, he stayed at the counter chatting with Mrs. Chani. When he was ready to go, Mrs. Chani accompanied him and opened the door. It was now 1.15 p.m. and the street was busy. Mboya stepped out and he was shot twice. On 21st July, it was announced that the man who shot Mboya was Nahashon Isaac Jenga Joroge. In the book, Tom Boya, the man Kenya wanted to forget, David Goldsworthy writes that the 31-year-old Njenga was a former member of the Kanu Youth Wing and a former chairman of the Central Ward of Kanu's Nairobi branch. He had spent some years in Bulgaria training as a sepa and mechanic. Since his return, he had tried his hand at various small businesses. Njenga claimed that he had known Mboya for nine years and regarded him as friend. So it made many wonder, how can a man Mboya helped end up being his shooter. Nine witnesses to the shooting failed to identify Njenga in the police lineups, which begs the question, did Njenga really shoot Mboya or he was covering up for someone? After his arrest, Njoroge asked, why do you pick me? Why not the big man? On 10th September 1969, Njenga was convicted and sentenced to death. An appeal to East African Court of Appeal was rejected. On 21st November, sources revealed that Njenga was hanged in secret on 8th November. However, in 1970, the then West Mugirango MP, George Justice Porara, 
while in Lusaka, Zambia, where he had traveled with a parliamentary committee, claimed that he saw Njenga at an entertainment joint. When they came back to Nairobi, the committee led by Kandara MP George Mushigi went to parliament and elected to inform the country what had transpired. Morara opened the Pandora's box. The government was given 48 hours to produce Njenga. Morara died in a road accident two days later while coming to Nairobi from Kakamega. Mboya had a good relationship with the West that made so many people uncomfortable. Mboya was a product of the Mau Mau War. And as a product of the Mau Mau War, the British were looking for or trying to create leadership for Africans because the existing leadership was bad. That's Kenyatta, Koinangia, Koinangia. You know those people who were associated with the Mau Mau War. And uh, many of them were locked up anyway. So there was a vacuum of leadership as far as the, the British were concerned. Yes, there were some chiefs, but who was paying attention to the chiefs anyway? <laughs> so you need somebody people listen to and be acceptable. And therefore, Mboya came in handy eh? as a budding trade unionist. Uh, they identified him and groomed him. Tom Boyer is a product of um, an American scheme to define the independence of African countries. You see, in 1947, um, Harry Truman was given a concert paper that uh, raised three things, two things, that um, African countries and third world countries are going to get independence. And that independence would impact negatively on the interests of, um, of the American economics, American economy. Because left on their own, African countries are going to pick either the socialist path of development or nationalistic path of development, or in this case, therefore, the neocolonial path. Boyer was pro-West, not pro-East. So he was a man of the West. He's actually like uh, what we call uh, a man of the West. Let's just call him man of the West. Um, Blue-eyed boy of the West. I've gotten the one, the blue-eyed one, a blue-eyed boy for the West. Because he spoke West, he argued for the West. Who knows why he became a man of the West? Maybe you remember even when the rights of Kenyatta were in prison, Boy had become, at 20 years, the inspector of sanitary workers in the big city of Nairobi. He had become the director, he, I mean, the supervisor, rather. He had been made. So he looked always a man who was gifted all the time. So you can see, even if he was a freedom fighter, he was not given the same, uh, the same beating, I call it beating, as the Kenyatta's or Neko's and others were given who were jailed, those who were jailed. Uh, so he, he could still have some hope somewhere with the West. As a budding trade unionist, they identified Mboya and groomed him. They provided him with opportunities to go to various places and be seen. As time passed, the British decided <clears throat> to give him a little more exposure other than simply attending conferences, eh? labor conferences, which they were arranging. Uh, so they gave him an opportunity to go to Oxford not to get a degree, but to rub shoulders. <laughs> to be seen to be with policy makers and uh, learn how to deal with it. So he was their boy. Professor Masharia adds that the fact he was groomed by the British could not water down the fact that he worked very hard. In the book Tomboya, the man Kenya wanted to forget, David Goldsworthy says Ruskin College knew that they were receiving an unusual student. He was in a different position from the average Ruskin students, or even others from the colonies. And while at Oxford, um, being um, groomed by Marjorie Parham, the Marjorie Parham, very influential British um, operator in the colonial circles at Oxford. And uh, she had a reputation for identifying and grooming potential African leaders. And like, um, 
and somebody, a Wolowo in Nigeria, was one of her pro products. Uh, even Elliot Madhu, uh, they, you know, they, they, she was, he said that, and we give them a <coughs> chance to, to rub shoulders in the highest circles. The problem with Elliot Madhu was that he was a Kikuyu. And the Kikuyus were guilty of the Mau Mau. So <laughs> they needed somebody who is not associated with that. And Boya was perfect. While in England, Boya requested to go to the United States of America. There was an organization waiting for him, the American Committee of African Affairs, together with the African American Institute. Sunday, the eradication of poverty, disease, and ignorance. They were created in 1953, two of them, mainly because as a reaction to the Mau Mau War. And the idea was, since it was clear that Africans eventually <laughs> would take off, we start preparing, grooming good Africans. So when the time comes, they will be on this western side of the Cold War. <laughs> that was the game, eh? So I have no doubt in my mind that uh, Tom Boyer was a project of the West. And that's why when he goes to the USA, a small boy in our government, he has huge, huge access. Gets in touch with, uh, with, uh, with Kennedy, with meets Martin Luther King, um, with the mission of just uh, seeing to it that the guy is well anchored. Professor Masharia adds that the African American Institute was created and funded by the CIA. The American Committee of African Affairs was created by the Liberals. The Liberals are people who look for America's interest in the long run. Realizing that this is going to happen, whether we like it or not, you might as well prepare to win these Africans to your side. And that's why you have people like um, the American labor unions, and um, um, that's why John Kennedy comes in. Eh? Yeah? As one of those people who are looking beyond 1950s to American interests, in the future, it's trying to shift away from the Eisenhower uh, position that initially tended to support the British in everything for their own Cold War logic, because they need their British in the Cold War. So the British uh, well, they were exerting something. <laughs> so initially, the Eisenhower administration was fully supportive of the British operations in Kenya against the Mau Mau. They even got into small deals there and there. <laughs> so I want to think that in trying to package Tom Boyer to come and become an African leader, first, he had to be in touch with those in power. And then second, he had to be on the right side of the civil rights movement. So I want to think that's how the, um, the American administration gave him a chance to connect with uh, both the civil rights movement as well as the right civil rights movement and uh, the establishment in power. According to Professor Masharia, the British and the Americans were looking for a good African they can groom and become now the official leader of the Africans. When uh, he indicated he would like to go to the US, the, the um, <clears throat> American Committee on African Affairs was waiting for him. They published it, yeah? sold his pamphlet. Uh, then. And why was he so attractive? Very articulate, brilliant, intelligent, photogenic. So he made some young ladies go wild. <laughs> so there was something nice about him. Eh? He was a good African looking, eh? not like the ones that have been portrayed in looking like wild. Eh? And the Kenyatta's with them. Oh, no, the, the dreadlocks, or even um, sometimes they portray, uh, portray the Kenyatta as if he's a wild man. And, you know, in those days, eh? So now to get an African who looks polished, who speaks the language they understand, eh? you are excited. It is no wonder that the Times, uh, the Times, the New York Times, for the first time in 1959, put cover handwriting. They put a photo of Boya in the cover, cover title, the, the, the cover page. 
they put the photo of Mboya and described him as probably the next leader of Africa. You know, in the likes of Marcus Gavi, Tom, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, they saw him beyond what Kenyans saw him. They, they could see a very talented man through those press conferences that uh, uh, he held in New York and other cities in, uh, in the West. Boya's impact in post-independence uh, Kenya is really immeasurable. Nobody can account for it. Tom Boya was the most sophisticated, armed with very high analytical skills and sufficient connections to the West. In fact, most of his documents are, are, are assisted by American professors. If you read Jarabogi's book, <laughs> Not in Uru, he gives a breakdown of those who took part in, in shaping up the book. Ruth Fast, all those leftists of those years. If you go to Moyas, minimum, almost nil, because they were plastic, they, they were just games designed to, 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 to package the guy as a person with, with sufficient brains. But our independence ideologue, the, neo, the ideologue of our neocolonial independence was Tom Boyer. And those who hoped to pursue another path, his counterpart, was Pio Gamapinto. I think I can say that um, to a very large extent, uh, the Kenyatta team faction were, were mere chess pieces under the control of Tom Boyer. Professor Masharia says that Mboya was given more publicity than any other African. He was on national TV and he was articulate. So they created now Mboya, yeah? the big name. Uh, so met uh, with Vice President um, Richard Nixon at the time and uh, we were, they told him what to do, she put it. The labor union, the big AFL-CIO, was uh, gang hall of them, impressed him as their man. He returned to Kenya in 1956, where he was received very well as the leader of Africans. The image was created that now Africa has a new leader, Mboya, because he had the right connection, the labor unions and the CIA. When he returned, he came with money from the American labor unions that he used to build the Solidarity Building, now the Kotu headquarters at Gikomba. Part of the reason that it was built in Gikomba is that Africans were not allowed on the side of Uhuru Highway. So they built it for him, and they really became, uh, they owned him. Uh, one of the peculiar developments was that the British were not amused. So this is our boy, we created him. And then the Americans come and steal him. <laughs> yeah. As, um, as one of the student, one of the major parent students who um, interacted with him at Boston University. <laughs> He's the one who was telling me how Marjorie was angry. Yeah? Because this is our boy. What are the Americans? And they usually they had a rivalry as to who controls Kenya in the future. And boy, I was supposed to be their boy. And then they would come and steal him. The British were not amused. There was desire to promote Mboya as the leader of Africans, which brought problems with other African leaders like Ghana's president, Kwame Nkrumah. In 1958, Nkrumah organized a big anti-colonial conference. In that conference, with Nkrumah shining, Mboya's star was also felt. And then he used the opportunity very well to sound like a champion of Pan-Africanism, anti-colonialism. So he, <clears throat> he told the colonial official oh, to scram out of Africa, the way they have scrambled into it. That's what captured imagination, scram out of Africa. They, you know, and they, they boosted his stock up, eh? and he spoke with the Americans, eh? <laughs> who are doing what was necessary to keep him uh, popular. In Kip Kyle's book, The Politics of Independence of Kenya, on 6 March 1959, 34 leading members of the Nairobi People's Convention Party, Mboya being the party's president, were rounded up and the party's paper Uhuru was banned on grounds that it had imported and republished forbidden literature from India. Mboya was not arrested, a point noted with a suspicion by Omolo Agar, who was the organizing secretary of the party. When you read this book, this book called um, The Man Kenya Wanted to Forget, 
you see a very dramatic political leader in Tomboy, but he's not arrested even once. He's the only one who's not arrested, but most active. Why? During the time the Americans were interested in Moya, there was a growing number of African students who wanted to study in America. They created an organization that raised money to help these students. Martin Luther King Jr., John F. Kennedy were among those who contributed. Masharia adds that Kennedy was an anti-colonialist. Hence, linking up with Mboya was easy since he was also the chairman of the Senate Committee of the African Affairs. He also condemned the French in the Algerian War. That's the way it was initiated. The American Committee on African Affairs mobilizing resources so that they can pay for the aeroplane to bring students to North America. And uh, with the understanding that once they finish and they go back and independence comes, they are likely to be on the American side of the Cold War. <laughs> Professor Masharia adds that the politics of the airlift was something else because it also became a domestic issue. What would Mboya have become if he was not assassinated? If, if, if Mboya stayed longer, he had two things to his side, three things to his side. One, he had the brilliance and charisma. You see, two, he had the skill to mobilize. He was quite a good speaker. Therefore, and also networked nationally, okay? Then the other thing that was on his side was the West. They wanted him to be the main guy in the African continent as far as defending their interests was concerned. So with these three things to, uh, to his favor, I can't rule out his presidency in the early 70s. If Boy was not assassinated, I want to tell you from what I've gathered from reading all these books, all these books, yeah, all these books, uh, and even Paul Goldsmith, a British who wrote and did a very good research, Boya would have become, if not the president, he would have given hand time to acting president. Agutu Rosa, KT News.